This morning, let's open our Bibles to the New Testament book of Galatians. Galatians follows 2 Corinthians. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. If you don't have your Bible, there's one in the pew. You can take it and turn with me to Galatians 5, the Christian walk. As we go through this message and all messages, two things are going on. Number one, we are studying this chapter and the verses in this chapter, but you're also learning how to study and to teach verse by verse yourself. Now, in seminary, I took a lot of courses on how to prepare topical sermons, and I never did figure out how you could teach someone to do a topical study. And this is not a long dissertation on that. I could do topical studies, as most pulpits do, but I could never teach anybody how to do it, never knew anybody who could. But the beauty of the verse-by-verse -verse teaching, aside from being the oldest method of teaching, is that two things are going on. Number one, you are teaching and you're learning as you're hearing it, but you're also observing what I'm going to be doing. I'll be doing three things. I'll be making observation of the passage. I'll be observing it by reading it. I'll be making interpretation, explaining it, and application. How do you apply it to your lives? And there's one more thing, and that's illustration. Illustrating it by examples. Usually my favorite illustratees are my four furry friends in the back room here. Uh, that's four dogs, for those that might not know. And uh, so that's the verse-by-verse -verse method. It goes back to Ezra, who did this in the book of Nehemiah when they came back from Babylon. It was the method of teaching among the reformers when they broke loose from the tyranny of the doctrine of works of Roman Catholicism. And it has always been the method to be used to teach people the Word of God and to teach them how to study it and to go out and teach it to others. So, what's I want, I want to actually teach you how to teach the Word of God, but not teach you so well that you take my job, okay? <laughs> so, uh, with that in mind, let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, we thank you for this chance to study your Word. Help us to really understand it and be totally changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Galatian church, was trying to deal with a problem which invades the church to this day. The struggle between the gospel of faith by grace and the doctrine of works. What do I have to do to get to heaven? That's the question being asked by most people in the world today. What do I have to do to get to heaven? And most folks come to the conclusion, I guess I have to be a good person, and while I'm not a, the best person, I'm better than the guy next door. And so there's this struggle of how we are finding ourselves pleasing to God. This question was asked of Jesus about 2,000 years ago. And in John chapter 6, the question was asked in verse 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? What do we have to do to please God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Period. I'll read it again. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Now the church through the ages, and especially in the dark ages, was locked into the doctrine of works. All sorts of things were added to the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace simply says it's by faith in Jesus Christ that you alone are working uh, the salvation through Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 gives it to you very succinctly. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You're saved by grace, and you're saved by faith in Christ. But then he says, you're saved to serve. In verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Incidentally, if you're looking for a job, that's the, my favorite verse here, verse 10, Ephesians 2. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God, you have prepared my job for me. Prepare me for my job and help me to find it. And 
he'll show you how to go about doing that. Well, the Galatians had been saved by grace through their faith in Christ when Paul had come to visit them on his first missionary journey. But after Paul left, there were others who came in known as Judaizers who began to say, you need to become circumcised, you need to become Jews, and that was this terrible doctrine of works. Christ did not do all that is necessary for your salvation. You must have baptism. You must do communion. You must do last rites. You must tithe. You must come to church. You must read the Bible. You must pray. You must do good works. None of that is going to save us. And none of that is going to maintain our salvation. And I grew up in a Pentecostal background where the point was hammered in, you can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. That is nothing but a doctrine of works in disguise. Saved by grace, maintained by works. Hey, if I can work to maintain my salvation, I can work to get my salvation. Now, there are only two ways to get saved. Number one is to keep the law and do the works completely. All 613 laws of the Old Testament, never once from infancy coming out of the womb to the day you go into the tomb, ever sinning. Can it be done? It can be done. It was done by one person, and that was Jesus Christ. But, apart from Jesus, we all come under the condemnation of sin, and that's what Paul says in the Roman church, that we are all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So we need plan B. Plan B is for sinners, such as you and I, we come to Christ and put our faith in Him and say, Lord, all that's necessary for righteousness, right standing before God, to be saved and to maintain that salvation is faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work. The very last words the Lord said on the cross, tetelestai in the Greek, which was a term to mean paid in full. You bought something from the merchant, you paid it on time, you made the final payment, when the final payment was made, the item was yours, and he wrote on your receipt, Tetelestai, paid in full. All that was necessary for our salvation and righteousness was paid in full at the cross. Now, Paul, in his epistles, has a pattern, which I believe is very, very important. When you look at his epistles, especially now starting with Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, he starts off by talking about doctrine or teaching, and then he talks about duty, what you and I should do. He doesn't come in and say, as we're tempted to say to our neighbors, you need to stop doing this, you need to stop doing that, you need to stop doing the other. That's not the gospel method according to Paul. He comes in with doctrine first. This is what God has done for you. He has sent his only begotten son to the cross to die for you. He has washed you and cleansed you of your sins when you come to Christ. He has put his Holy Spirit inside of you to enable you to walk with him daily in righteousness known as sanctification. And as he gives you the doctrine and tells you what God has done, then and only then does he say, because of what God has done, now this is what you are to do. And that's the part we're getting into today as we get into the duty or our obligations. Again, we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith, but we are saved to work, and our works become evidence of the work of grace. So today we're going to be talking about the Christian walk. And Paul is going to view Christianity in three terms. He's going to talk about walking in liberty, walking in love, and walking in the Spirit, or the Holy Spirit. My lesson here, I think, for chapter 4 is Christians should walk in all three, in liberty, in love, and in the Spirit. So let's begin with chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6 as we talk about walking in liberty. He wants us to be free, not under bondage of the law, the do's and the don'ts, but be free and also be hopeful. Verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you to walk, look in the wrong book here, Galatians, uh, Ephesians, my favorite book here. No one can sound right now. Let's go back to chapter 4. Let's try verse 1. Now I say that the heir, chapter 5, what's wrong right here? I think I'm on. Uh, chapter 5, here, the liberty. Stand fast. 
therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He's telling these believers, you were saved by grace. Don't become entangled with laws. The Jews going under the law of Moses must do this, must do that. Gentiles with the laws of their elementary religions, their families and what have you. He says, I want you to stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. John says, when the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. Not free to go out and sin, not free to have license to do evil, but we are absolutely, totally free from the law because Christ has satisfied the law on our behalf. So he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Another of the translations, if you have several other translations beside the New King James, which I teach from, or the King James, you will have something like, for freedom Christ has made us free, stand fast therefore, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Same idea, basically. Let's say, for example, that you're totally caught up in believing in the doctrine of grace, and I can convince you today that Christ has done all that's necessary for your life. That by God's word and the authority given to me, and hopefully to you, he has said, in order for you to truly be saved and to get to heaven, you must do only one thing. You must read the Bible every day for 30 minutes. If you don't read the Bible for 30 minutes, your salvation is in jeopardy. In fact, there's good authority to indicate you will lose your salvation or maybe never had it at all. So we are going to become known as the church that believes in the 30-minute rule of reading the Bible a day. You are saved by grace plus reading the Bible 30 minutes a day. How would you feel? If you believe that, A, you'd be a fool. And if you believe that, then you'd start to strap on that 30 minutes. And you'd do it for a while. And you'd feel good. And then you begin to feel a little superior because of your friends who are going to these grace churches that say, it's great to read the Bible and you really should to be nourished and fed, but you know you're saved only by Christ whether you read the Bible or not. Then you begin to feel superior. And that's how the Galatians were feeling. And that's how these legalistic churches begin to feel. They strap on their works and their duties and they begin to feel superior to others who are not fulfilling that. And you can smell that legalism. You can smell that attitude. And there are people who believe that. There are those, and you can see them down south, especially right on the billboard, where it's going to say KJV 1611. What does that mean? The 1611 original version, which nobody has, by the way. Not by 50 years. And in some of those churches, they honestly believe that you are not reading the Word of God unless you are reading the King James Version. There are those who say, you must observe the Sabbath. You must observe the Sabbath on Saturday, which is the seventh day, and if you don't observe the Sabbath, you are going to go to hell. See, that's legalism. That's bondage. When Jesus said, tetelestai, it's finished, it's finished. All that's necessary for your salvation was done by me. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 5, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Don't go back and say, I have to keep the law to please God. Verse 2, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. So if you are going to go under the law of circumcision, remember the law of circumcision was given to Abraham, and uh, he had to have his boys circumcised, he himself had to be circumcised. It was then incorporated later on in the law of Israel, for Israel. And the circumcision, which of course was the physical circumcising of the male penis on the eighth day, and incidentally, how great is God? Doctors have told us that on the seventh day, the blood does not coagulate enough. You can have a real problem of bleeding. Much after the eighth day, there's tremendous pain. And so it's just the right time for circumcision and how wise God is. But he said that male circumcised act, the cutting away of the flesh, is to symbolize an inward work of God. 
that inward work is I want 